Hello and welcome to the Full FX Unfiltered. My name is Colin Lambert, I'm publisher of the Full FX, and this edition is in association with CLS. And I'm delighted to be joined by Lisa Danino Lewis, who is Chief Growth Officer at CLS, and Keith Tipple, who is Chief Product Officer at CLS. Nice to see you both. It's been a while, especially in person. Um, Lisa, I thought I'd kick off with you. One of the big growing events in the foreign exchange's near future is T plus one security shift in the US. Can you sort of take us through what the key issues are, what it means for the industry, and you know, what, what the main challenges are? Sure. I guess when we look at it, the reason that the move to T plus one for the US was mandated was to alleviate risk. And, and I think if, when we look at this security side, it seems to be doing what it's meant to do, or certainly that's what the clients that are involved in the associations are saying. But what it seems to have done is transferred an element of that risk, certainly to the FX side, which I don't think was considered properly. Um, the key risk there in the FX market really depends on the end user, predominantly the asset managers, if they are executing their equity on market close, then normally normal process is to execute your foreign exchange immediately thereafter or next day. Now in a T plus two world, that's okay because it moves yeah. to T1, but in a T1 it moves to T0 potentially. There's that small window of opportunity to execute at the end of the US market close, but obviously we know liquidity is probably at its lowest point there. And then there are challenges around getting those trades into CLS for our deadline, which is midnight CET. But custodians often have their deadlines slightly before, or actually in some cases, you know, quite considerably before. So the market is definitely very much focused in the foreign exchange area on what this issue is and, and possible ways of solving it. Mm. And it certainly, it, it was nowhere and all of a sudden, I think with the one year anniversary, probably, it start, yeah, we started looking at it. And I guess it's an even bigger issue for people in my region in Asia, because their window is even tighter than the Europeans, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's elements of Asia, I think, because they've always been dealing with that challenge that are a little bit more advanced. There's still some that are trying to work it out. But it, we seem to be hearing a lot more, interestingly, a lot more noise from Americas and Europe. Yeah. Um, that's not saying that there's not an issue in Asia. There certainly is. Um, but it's that compressed timeline that's, that's really stressing yeah. the asset manager community out to understand how they can, you know, still achieve best execution whilst mitigating settlement risk and, and taking advantage of the the other benefits from CLS, which really is that multilateral netting benefit yeah. and those operational process benefits that come with it as well. Yeah. Keith, how big an issue is it though? I mean, you get various numbers and obviously we all know about foreign holdings of US securities, whatever, but how big an issue do you think it is in the analysis you've done? Yeah, so let me, let me come on to that. But just, just one follow-up point in terms of timing, because you've asked the question about APAC. Actually, the real pinch point we see that maybe people can do something about is between four and six Eastern Standard Time. We'll come on to that in a little bit more detail in terms of how that overlaps with, with CLA settlement cutoffs in a minute. But to answer your question, we, we were curious, right? We, we saw lots of stuff in the press when, when the SEC finally announced the date, you know, I think possibly earlier than some people were expecting, but that's the date. Yes. That's, that's where everybody has to work to. And we saw a number of articles in the press estimating the size of the flow that may not make its way into CLA settlement, you know, come that implementation date at the end of May. 24, uh, you know, we didn't recognise some of these figures. So we, we sit on a lot of data, as you know. Yeah. We settle, you know, about six and a half trillion US dollar equivalent a day. It's a big number. That's one and a half million, that order of magnitude, transactions a day. So we sit on a lot of data. We want to use it. We wanted to know, but we also thought it was useful for the market to try and calibrate how much of the flow potentially won't make its way into CLA settlement if there's no behaviour change in the market, which, of course, there will be some, right? Um, so what do we do? We, we, we took a look at our database, we took a whole month uh, of our data and we tried to estimate sort of a proxy for what, what relates to um, people buying and selling securities. So we looked at the asset management community, so where there's a fund on one side of the trade, yeah. there's a dollar one side of the trade, so either people are buying securities, right, and, they're, and they're, you know, it relates to somewhere where you need to find the dollars, or you're selling, you're, you're bringing those dollars and you're bringing it back to your home currency, right? Yeah. So we do that analysis and we looked at it and we said, okay, let's look at the, every single transaction within that category I just mentioned there and look 
but how many match in the, 20, in the 48 hours up to our cut time? Because those 48 hours aren't going to be there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, if no behaviour change is, you're going to lose 24. <laughs> so we're losing a day. You're going to lose. Actually, you're going to lose a bit more because of custodian cutoff yes. times that Lisa mentioned. So we looked at that and we tried and we estimated that. And what does that mean? That drops out about one percent of our average daily value that we settle okay. uh, equates to those hours that you're you're going to lose if there's no behaviour. People don't do things differently. So 65 billion. So, so the 65. Still got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's good math, Colin. We like that. Um, and look, you, you, could, you could arguably say that it's more than that because yeah. a lot of banks auto hedge those trades out at the time of execution. Maybe they don't, maybe they wait, maybe they don't. Maybe you could double that. But these are in extremist numbers, right? No behavior change. And, you know, so 65 in extremists, double that, 130. Now, uh, yeah, it's only 1%, 2%, whichever side of that you want to take. Uh, and so that is a small proportion of what we settle, but it's a big number. Well, I'd say, yeah, as the man said, a billion here, a billion there, so you're talking real money. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And there's a big, big difference between what's in CLS settlement and it's only coming out for many reasons, right? You know, you, it's bilateral risk, nobody wants that. Yeah. You know, literally nobody, both, both on the yeah. policy side and, and market participants. Uh, it means that can a party settlement risk limits are suddenly getting filled up, yeah. etc. And, and this is not an outcome that anybody wants. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's why clearly we're involved in the conversations, but there's much broader industry focus to try and make sure as much as possible the flow can still make its way in. Yeah, I mean, to Lisa's point, you know, they weren't considering the FX. You know, US regulators and FX, I think we all know that's a bit of a, of a barren desert. but. Yeah, it is things like, you know, they're actually raising risks elsewhere, which I think is the interest, which probably wasn't considered ultimately. Yes, it's about reducing one risk here, but there's always an inevitable knock-on flow. So, especially over the last couple of months, CLS has become more front and centre of people's search for a solution. So what is CLS at the moment considering in terms of um, react, you know, a reaction to this impending change? So I think Keith mentioned a moment ago sort of that pinch point between four o'clock, so the market close in the US and, and 6 p.m., which effectively is our midnight CET deadline. To be able to obviously finalize your execution on your equity, process that, trigger the FX, execute the FX, and then get it into CLS's a lot of processes. So we've been um, talking a lot to the asset manager associations, um, industry bodies, the asset manager community themselves, and they've asked us whether it would be feasible for us to move our deadlines at all. And I guess it's, uh, one of the key things here is to understand what that means. So we have our midnight CET deadline, which is when we kick off that multilateral netting process and we produce our initial pay-in schedule that goes out to our members. Shortly thereafter, we have a liquidity tool that the majority of our members use that helps to condense that pay-in schedule a little bit further, yeah. brings it down to around 99% netting efficiency. And then at 6.30 CET, we issue a revised pay-in schedule to our members. So there's six and a half hours there yeah. that you could say, actually, is there anything we can do? And we looked internally, and I'll pass to Keith in a minute to talk a little bit more about the internal workings of what we could possibly do as an organisation, just looking at CLS, and, and we said actually 90 minutes is probably the most we can move it because there are certain processes that need to run at that point. So there's a couple of things to consider. One is what we look at internally and what that might mean to us as an organisation. But I think more importantly, we're only as strong as our weakest link. We've got 74 members. Obviously, ultimately, they have thousands of clients behind them. We have over 34,000 clients who utilise the platform. So we need to make sure that our members can you know, facilitate and, and continue to pay in safely. So we have issued a questionnaire to all of our members yep. to understand what impact that might have if we look to potentially move that deadline 30, 60 or 90 minutes. So will it have no minimal, moderate or significant impact? And, and if it does, what does that mean and what, what it looks like? So. We've got some of those responses in. We're still waiting to get the rest of them, and we'll see what that looks like. That's sort of one part of the puzzle. Yeah. We've got to do our own internal part, and then we need to look at the, the regulatory aspect. But I'll, I'll pass over to Keith, because you can talk a little bit Which more about that Which is actually a big part of CLS. People forget <clears throat> you know, how you know, critical the infrastructure is and, and how firmly regulated, to a degree, 
you are compared to maybe some other providers in our industry. Yeah, and rightly so. Right? Yeah. I mean, if, if we don't settle yeah. on, a, on a given day, it's a big problem for the market. Yes, yeah. the size of what we settle, uh, and actually the liquidity efficiency we bring to the market uh, from a funding standpoint. Let, let's dig into the, some of the details, right? So we've got. Can we change? We can, right? We, we've got the system capability. We think they have sort of about 90 minutes max. So that's, and that, that's a lot, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Right? Nine, you know, if yeah. somebody, for example, has got a custodian cutoff time of, of 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, so that's, they've got an hour after market close to get everything done. If we can go an hour, hour and a half, that's more than double their window, yeah. right? assuming it's passed on. But is, it, uh, is there an issue with allocations? Because I think allocations can take well, place afterwards, let, can't they? Let, let me, actually, no, they can't. Oh, OK, no, right. Absolutely yeah. not. So I can, I can answer yeah. that question right now. Good. So we, we settle in CLS settlement at the allocated level, right. at the legal entity level. Yeah. So the whole post-trade process needs to complete. Yeah. Right? So again, it's, it's a pinch point. But let's break down what it means. So for us, our analysis, our initial analysis is we can make that change. That's not something that is, is, is seismic for us. Yeah. Yeah, the system, system has been designed to be able for that deadline to move. It would mean, though, that um, that's external, right? This is not as us. It's always got to work to a new time frame. Yeah. And it's not just the fact that it'll be later in the, in the, well, the morning, Eastern Standard Time, later in the afternoon, uh, late, late afternoon US time, but you know, in terms of people's operational platforms. So we're typically an organisation, a member organisation today, they'll have systems that know that that's the deadline and they'll work to that and they'll have exception management processes around if that, if those timelines change and they'll be routing things elsewhere. So there is system change for all of our, uh, likely all of our members who move to move that mm -hmm. timeline. Uh, there's operational aspects in terms of do they have people in the office at times where they need to do things related to our, our, our diamonds. And last but not least, there's a liquidity aspect. As Lisa alluded to, we have this thing called an out swap process. It, uh, it runs and we communicate about 15 minutes past our cutoff. So that's now 15, 15 minutes past midnight CET at the moment. Uh, the result of our in out, in out swap process. And, and that's important because people at that point have the information well, they'll know the likely funding requirement into, yep. into CLS settlement. It's not a definitive answer, but it's, a, it's enough that people can start and line up resources. And also that outleg that we create as part of that and outs, what well, needs to be found is yeah, that's outside the CLS settlement, but it's a funding requirement that an organisation can't predict themselves. It's an algorithm, it's multilateral nature, you can't reverse engineer it because yeah. you don't have all the data. So that's another thing we need to dig into because we need to make sure our members, if we move that 90 minutes out, do they have the time to, to find the funds to meet both their pay into CLS settlement, but also to fund their outleg. Yeah. And it's quite a nuanced point, because again, you might think, for example, an APAC organization is most impacted by that, but actually a North American organization that doesn't have an operation in APAC, but may end up having a Kiwi dollar yeah. uh, amount to fund and needs to communicate to their Nostro during end of day time in Canada, for example, does that still work? So it's really nuanced because every member is at least somewhat different. Do they self-clear the currency? Do they need a Nostro? Where are they physically located? Do they ever follow the Sun operations team or do they not? And it gets, it gets quite yeah. detailed. So the questionnaire digs into that, but we're going to have to do our own assessment as well, whether the market can adapt to this change in a way that is going to be uh, smooth, is not going to end up with a situation where we're going to see something different to what we've seen yeah. for the last 20 years, which is, and the term I use is pain stability. It was yeah. still going to be able to perform against their, their paying requirement to see their settlement and everything else around that. Yeah. If that were to change significantly, then we shouldn't be making this change. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. Yes, it, <clears throat> you know, it's something you can change, but you have to be able to take your members in particular with you. And the regulatory piece of that is to yeah. finish off quickly, of course, and rightly so. Um, you know, we, we are regulated heavily, um, and you know, primary regulator is the Fed. And we've got an oversight committee of 23 central banks. Yeah, this is a material change, and they yeah. need to be comfortable. So there's going to be some. You know, if we get to that point yeah, yeah. where we where we ask the question formally, there will be a formal regulatory uh, approval process, to, to, and rightly so, for yeah. for, for reasons yeah. I've already alluded to. So, how does it evolve from here then? I mean, how do you, how do you see this playing out in you know, the best the best guess you can give us? Because obviously there is still so much up in the air, but. You know, the deadline as we sit down now is some six months away. How do you think it evolves? How ready is the industry for this now, for instance, Lisa? 
Yeah, I mean, from our certainly from our re- outreach to the asset manager community, they're not ready. I think they've waited a long time, and I think there's been a general wish for there to be a solution or a delay, and it doesn't look like it's forthcoming. You know, when we've spoken to uh, to our clients, at least 35% of them have no solution yet defined. Yeah. So there's still a lot of uncertainty. You know, we are, as we've talked about, trying to do our best to help and assist and support the market. That's going to take time. Are we going to be able to, if everything aligned, are we going to be able to deliver for May? That's highly unlikely, just given the complexity yeah. of it. Um, and I also think, you know, this is sort of one step. We've already got ESMA looking at the call for evidence for Europe. We've got the UK looking at T plus one as well. So this is these are the next yeah. steps. So, I mean, look, the, we're I learning. Have, I have a nightmare where ESMA goes to T plus one just as the US goes to T plus zero. Probably. Could well happen. <laughs> Not going to happen. No. <laughs> you heard it here first, everybody. <laughs> but yeah, please, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. But we, no, but I was just saying, so we've got, I mean, we're learning a lot from the US experience, yeah. which I think is good. Obviously, it's not going to solve the problem, yeah. but it hopefully means that we won't repeat some of those challenges as we go, you know, as this rolls out further globally. Yeah. Overall, how optimistic are you that we can overcome this challenge? There's a lot. There's a lot to do. Actually, my observation is is broader than that. I think we, there's a lot of focus from, again, rightly so, from global regulators, you know, central banks, uh, and just generally, actually, firm, firms been organised around making sure that the market's resilient. Right? There's a, there's a lot going on geopolitically, for example, yeah, yeah. concerns about cyber. Well, it's not as though markets acquire them. Exactly. Is it? As a so there's a lot going on, and, and, and it may get rougher going forward. I don't want to yeah, sort yeah. of so, you know headwinds and stormy water yeah. stuff because, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it's it, there's a big focus on that. And actually, one of my personal observations is the fact that as you shorten settlement cycles, the market is less resilient. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and not not just not just because everybody's grabbing around and, and what do you do about exception. But actually, if there's an outage yeah. of, of somebody, you know, let's say Swift, let's say Swift's out for an hour. Swift's, if Swift's out for an hour in a T plus two context, you're probably okay, unless you're yeah. really unlucky with the timing. If Swift's out for an hour, and, and that's just no will, by the way. No, no, no. Um, so, but, but it well, could happen. I mean, we saw it with the ion. I mean, it, it ion takes its cybersecurity seriously. It, it still can make it go down. If you're, if you're out for an hour or two hours in a yeah. T plus one context, you, you're very likely to be in serious trouble very quickly. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, you've got, Again, you push it on a balloon, you, you reduce risk an hour, you push it out somewhere else. And I think that bigger picture about general resilience, I think, is often missed. And I, what I do hope is that people that make these policies start to realise that shorter settlement cycles is not some sort of panacea. T plus one is probably the furthest it should ever go. Yeah. And arguably, some aspects of T plus one are creating a lot of risk in certain parts of the market. I couldn't agree more. No, there's a rarity. <laughs> I think it's happened once. In the yeah, I think, it was. I, think we've just, I think we've just doubled it, haven't we? Yeah. Um, Keith, Lisa, great to talk to you as ever. Um, thanks for your time today. And um, thanks everyone for watching. And we'll be back again soon.